All right. And uh, can you guys see the slide? Well, can you see the slide deck right now? Yes, we can. Fantastic. All right. So uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, my name is Teddy Zanetos. Uh, I am the uh, deputy ops lead for Mars Helicopter Ingenuity, uh, also the tactical lead for the, for the project. Um, and let's get started. So uh, not sure how many of you are familiar with Ingenuity uh, and, and what Mars Helicopter is. We're going to play this video clip. Not sure how well it's going to work over the Zoom, but we'll give it a shot. And I'll just try and narrate because I don't know if the inspirational music is also playing in the background. So what we see here is a, uh, it's a rendering of what's going to be happening in just a handful of months. So um, Perseverance, uh, Mars 2020 is on its way to, to Mars. We're in cruise. And uh, under the belly is our baby Mars helicopter shown here. Um, Mars helicopter, uh, formal name is Ingenuity. It's going to be the first time we fly on Mars our Wright Brothers moment um, for Mars. We've never flown any vehicle on Mars before. Uh, this will be the first powered flight on another planet. Uh, and we really want this to blow open the doors for future aerial exploration. Um, for science reasons, for human exploration reasons, you name it, we want this to be the, the big checkbox that, that uh, will lead the way for the future. So uh, let's just talk about a couple of questions real quick, right? Um, why is a rotorcraft on Mars valuable? Why is that useful? Um, Mark was just showing some awesome uh, slides about what we've accomplished on the surface so far with rovers. Um, there's a different dimension that, that's added, uh, no, no pun intended there, um, with being able to fly on Mars. Uh, we can scout out for rovers um, or other assets, we can fly around corners, try and save planning time, mobility time by, by exploring. We have, a, we have orbiters around Mars that are able to take really good imagery and help with the planning cycle, um, but having a much closer sort of mesoscale imaging system that can help with that planning uh, would be a, an extremely valuable tool. Um, again, you know, not just what's around the corner, um, is it possible traversability uh, to get down a certain path? Um, actually being able to execute science, right? Future rotorcraft uh, would be able to carry meaningful payloads on board and, and fly to specific locations to, to, to sample and, and potentially measure uh, areas of interest that are to date unaccessible by rovers. Um, Rotorcraft, you can imagine, can fly down the side of a cliff, can fly into sinkholes, can uh, you know move tens of kilometers per, per day, uh, per flight rather, uh, and, and really cover much larger swaths of area. So again, just bridging the gap between orbital and ground level imagery, that, that, that's kind of one of the big uh, advantages of having a rotorcraft. And we'll skip through some of these since we've already covered them. So uh, to, to the fun part, right? I think establishing the, the value of, uh, of rotorcraft on Mars, uh, I, think, I think everyone can understand that. Um, but what a lot of this presentation is going to focus on is, all right, how do we, how, how do, we do that, right? Once, once everyone's on board with building a Mars helicopter, uh, how do you actually do that? How do you test a Mars helicopter? Uh, there's no instruction manual. There's no build to print for, for, for ingenuity. Um, so what does that verification campaign look like? Uh, and, and how do you get it ready to convince just not just yourselves, but JPL and people at headquarters that, yeah, we're good to go. We can fly on another planet. Let's, uh, let's send it to the Cape and launch it. Um, so let's talk about conditions. Why is it difficult, right? Um, a, there's long distance to earth. Um, that means you need to have autonomous uh, flight and landing capabilities all on board. We can't joystick the thing. Uh, we can't move a little bit, uh, take some imagery, replan based off what we see. Uh, the flights are 90 seconds long. So, so everything needs to be done autonomously on board. Um, it's very thin atmosphere. So it's 1% that of Earth's. Uh, that means you need to be very light. Uh, you need to have large lightweight blades, spin them very, very fast, 2,500 RPMs to stand any sort of chance of producing enough lift to get up off the surface. 
and it's very cold. Uh, I can get down to negative 90 degrees Celsius at night. Um, we're using lithium ion batteries. Um, and as, as most of you know, as roboticists, that uh, lithium batteries don't like being cold. Uh, neither do electronics, things that have different coefficients of thermal expansion. Uh, you get down very cold, you can start having some issues with your hardware. So we need to be able to keep ourselves warm. Uh, all, again, self-contained. Um, the concept of ingenuity is that once we get deployed from the rover, that's it. We are separated. We're never going back. Uh, we're not going back to refuel the batteries, <laughs> top off the tank, so to speak. Um, uh, we need to be completely self-sufficient. And that's why we have a solar panel on board that through every sol cycle, we'll be recharging our lithium uh, battery pack. Um, from those challenges that were kind of distilled down the three commandments uh, from the engineering side, we need to keep the mass very low, below two kilograms total. Uh, the rotor speed I mentioned, uh, you know, in within the 1900 2800 RPM range, depending on uh, where the landing site was to be selected. This is going back years ago when the original design for for ingenuity for ingenuity was happening. Um, different locations will be at different MOLA uh, and and therefore have different air densities associated with them. So we'll need to modulate the rotor speed for that. Uh, and the blade tip Mach number, we want to keep that under 0.7. Uh, going much higher gets us closer to the speed of sound on Mars and has its own aerodynamics and controls problems. So uh, the fundamental question going back several years now is, is it even possible, right? How do you prove that this wacky zany idea uh, will work? How do you prove that, that we can pull this off? Uh, and the answer is testing. Uh, build something that's somewhat representative uh, and, and try it out. So we have fantastic facilities at JPL uh, to simulate our, our environments of interest. We have a 25 foot space simulator and our team put a small one third scale helicopter in there, stuck the air out, matched the density of Mars and tried out a couple of experiments. Uh, this one in particular ha ha had a lot of lessons learned. Uh, that bit at the end there wasn't always shown, <laughs> uh, my understanding through the evolution of the project. Um, but it shows that, shows that we learned some important lessons about the difficulty of control uh, at 1% atmosphere, uh, how to stabilize these rotorcraft on Mars. Uh, it's not the same exact story as how you stabilize it here on Earth. Um, so once you answer the question, all right, we think we can fly on Mars, we can produce enough lift, fine, uh, but can we do it uh, contr controllably? Can we do it in a way that we know that we're not gonna crash uh, and by the way, that was you know human joystick that last that last flight to try and keep everything stable uh, by uh, by very skilled pilots. Um, so now moving up the, the 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 spectrum here of autonomy. Okay, we can joystick it. Uh, it crashed. There's some difficulties in trying to control one percent. Let's try and now do this with a little more autonomy wrapped around. Um, so the team built a proof of concept helicopter, full full size rotor system, so 1.2 meters from tip to tip. Um, the same coaxial design as Ingenuity, but you can see in the image, uh, it's, it's kind of a skeleton. Um, we have our, our IR of Icon tracking balls. That's how uh, we, we were able to track the motion of the rotorcraft within the chamber. Um, but there's no power system on board. Uh, there's no compute on board. It's really just an actuator, what you're looking at. Uh, there, there's an umbilical that's going down to the ground uh, that's connected to a bunch of computing on the background, also uh, power supplies in the background. Um, but this, again, lets us baby step our way forward. Uh, a lot of, pretty much all of Ingenuity has been baby stepping the, the, the entire project forward one step at a time to get ready for launch. Um, and that led us to this. Uh, what we're looking at right now, and again, I hope this is coming through well on the, uh, on the Zoom, is our first engineering design model uh, flight uh, inside of a Mars-like atmosphere. So. We're in our 25-foot space simulator at JPL. Uh, we've matched the density uh, on Mars. And we have a controlled flight. So, so this was the first flight of, of that, uh, of this full-scale temperature that I was talking about. Um, Again, the power system's not on board, the umbilicals uh, carrying the commands. Uh, 
and, and all the energy for the rotor system to spin. But this was the big check mark for the project to say, yes, uh, we can fly controllably out of Mars atmosphere. Um, let's move on to the next step. So now's the fun part, right? So, so, so up to there, it's you know hev heavily a controls uh, and actuator uh, uh, you know, GNC focused uh, effort, a lot of mechanical engineering to, to make that happen. Um, now comes the rest of the challenges. How do we do one that can actually survive on Mars? So how do we survive these extremely cold temperatures? Um, how do we make sure that we budget our energy throughout the night to 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 wake up? Uh, with enough energy in the tank uh, for sun uh, before sunrise happens, right? So that we can survive soul to soul uh, and fly as designed. Um, again, going back to those commandments, that means we really need to keep the mass, uh, the full up mass of the entire built up system. Forget umbilicals, uh, for, forget having all this other energy come from a separate source. We need to carry on batteries. Um, we need to have all the compute on board and, and make this as realistic as possible. Um, so that's 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 where the engineering model came in. So on the spectrum of development for, for a technology demonstrator, um, you know, we had the lift demonstrator, uh, the, the skeleton helicopter, uh, and the engineering model, uh, and, and like many projects at JPL, engineering models serve to be your test bed. You want it to be as realistic as possible to the flight model. Um, it, it, it is not the flight model, but but you want to learn all your lessons on the engineering model. Um, and the best way to do that is to is to build it as close as you can to what you think your flight model will be. So what we're looking at here is 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 our baby for, for our engineering model baby. Um, we have a I haven't really talked about the design of the of the rotorcraft, so so we'll take a second here. Let me just check how we're doing on time. Um, Mars helicopter is a coaxial helicopter. Um, so we have two rotors that spin counterclockwise to one another. Each rotor system uh, has full swashplate control. So you can see there's on the upper rotor, um, we have an upper swashplate and three servos uh, spaced 120 degrees apart. Um, that's how you can control your cyclic and your collective for the upper system. Uh, and then again, on the lower system, you have collective and cyclic control, full swashplate control on the lower rotor system. Uh, for those of you not familiar with, with cyclic and collective on, on rotorcraft that's what allows you to to flare the pitch of your blades um collective is is uniform uh, uh pitching throughout 360 degrees of revolution um whereas cyclic you it's it's periodic so so you you lean your swash blade in one direction that's what allows the rotorcrafts to to roll and pitch and effectively lean in one preferred direction or another is is differential thrust during that 360 degrees of rotation um, then we have underneath uh, our central avionics core. So it's a four-sided uh, box. If you can think about it, it, we have a box. Each side has our, our PCBs. We have an FPGA board, our Snapdragon board, um, our power electronics board, regulators, buck converters, stuff like that. Um, and then our telecom board. So we have a 900 megahertz, you know, commercial off the shelf uh, telecom link. Um, and then moving further down, you can see our here, it's maybe difficult to, to view, uh, is one of our sensor packages. So this black uh, box here, that's our laser altimeter pointing down at the ground, um, combined with uh, IMU, uh, inclinometer, and then we have a set of cameras. We have a black and white um, navigation camera, and that's what lets us to visual inertial odometry uh, at faster rate than, than what we're doing on the rovers. Uh, we're running around 30 hertz uh, visual inertial odometry uh, with that black and white camera looking down at the ground. And then we also have a color return to earth imager. That's not used at all for navigation. That's just to take some nice color images that's just like a cell phone camera that you'll have uh, inside your, your, your cell phone. Um, then uh, just some other things I wanna point out. The solar panel you can see on top here for the engineering model, that wasn't as critical since we weren't uh, bringing this out into the field to test. Um, but this is the, the, where the solar panel would be. Uh, and then our four legs and the four legs are designed to fold up so that we can uh, fit and tuck ourselves underneath the rover. So uh, lots of testing. Uh, so in the spirit of, of, of baby stepping our way, first thing you do when you have one of these things is let's spin it up. Uh, you want to attach it to something very, very rigid uh, and, and spin, the spin the blades very, very slowly. Try and understand what your vibration modes are, interactions between 
unintended interactions between your motor controller and the test stand dynamics um, uh, and, and kind of do a, a system smoke test, make sure, make sure all your actuators are working fine. Uh, then you, you wanna start moving your way up, right? Before you get to free flight, you wanna make sure that the rotorcraft can survive some crosswinds, right? Uh, at this stage in the project, we didn't have a wind tunnel that was qualified to operate in near vacuum in our space simulator chamber. So we had something like a poor man's wind tunnel where instead you, you just attach your rotorcraft to an arm and swing it back uh, side to side. And that, that, that does produce a little bit of a crosswind. So you can evaluate your controller in that scenario. Make sure you can observe that, that, that you're feeling these forces and how to counteract them. Uh, then you wanna make sure you're stable and rolling pitch, right? So we had to design our own gimbal, design a way to attach our umbilicals to that gimbal. Uh, and then hook up the rotorcraft to, to you know, command different pitch angles, command different roll angles, uh, and make sure this was all working as expected before we got ready for the free flights. Uh, here is an is a, is a image of that wind tunnel uh, once we got more funding later on in the project. Uh, we had something, I forgot how many hundreds of, of computer server fans uh, that were compatible with our vacuum chamber, baked them out, make sure that they were all clean, um, and put them in front of a honeycomb. Uh, it's, it may be hard to see the honeycomb here, but uh, run similar tests. So do roll and pitch uh, characterization with now this laminar cross flow of, of wind washing over the vehicle. And here's probably one of the shining moments of the VNV or design and integration and test campaign of Mars helicopter, the first free flight uh, of an engineering model. So everything uh, here we're doing in real time. Um, uh, and the entire engineering model is self-sustained. So the batteries are, are all within the avionics inside that box. Uh, Snapdragon and our microcontroller and FPJ on the board are running all the algorithms on board to make sure that we stay near. Specific video, find one more meter. Two little wave points are happening to the side, rotate, come back to orbit. And this, as best we can, this is really demonstrated the full uh, of what a flight on Mars is going to look like. Now, some of you may be wondering, um, okay, they got the chamber right, that takes care of the air pressure, uh, but what about gravity, right? Uh, we don't have any gravity guns from, from Half-Life that can help us out here. Um, there's a small string here uh, in this image. It's not just an artifact. Uh, that, that small string goes four stories up into our chamber uh, to something we designed and built uh, within the team called the gravity offload system. And it's really just a, a, a high-tech fishing reel. Uh, we, we, we designed a pulley, um, attach it to a, a torque encoder and a brush DC motor and, and wrapped a, a PID control loop around that to pull up with a very specific torque across a fixed radius pulley, which then equates to a very specific force, a very specific tension pulling up on the string. And, and that PID control loop was tuned to make sure that we were pulling up with the necessary offload so that to the helicopter's perspective, it felt like it was on Mars from, from, a, from a gravitational sense. That combined with the air density inside the chamber is the closest to Mars we can get uh, on the surface. Uh, there's some blue, uh, sorry, blue, some, there's some black fins around the perimeter of the chamber. Um, and that's what allows, uh, that, that's what allows you to flow coolant or liquid nitrogen through those fins to cool down the chamber that that kind of finishes the equation. Uh, when you're ready to, to, to have the density, uh, the gravity simulated, and then the temperatures exactly the way you want it to test for Mars. Um, here's the engineering design model uh, showing one of our flights where we didn't use the Vicon. Uh, we were actually using the onboard visual inertial odometry. Uh, we threw a bunch of Kapton down on the floor uh, for our features so that our, our visual inertial odometry system could actually track some features. 
Um, and again, very cool, very fun uh, test along the way to getting us to the launch pad. And the next stop is Mars. Um, so currently we're in cruise. Uh, we are, we are, this is the, uh, this is the final photo, uh, one of the final photos we have of Ingenuity as built um, before we sent it to our ATLO team, our assembly test launch operations team to integrate it to the rover and, uh, and get ready for flight. Um, you'll see this silver skin around our cube on, on the bottom. That's for thermals. That's our, our, our thermal insulation uh, to try and keep as much heat in as possible throughout the night. And you can, this is the first time you guys get to see our solar panel above and our 900 megahertz antenna. Uh, where is Ingenuity on Perseverance? So, so we're tucked in, under the belly. Uh, the legs fold up, the blades can't fold, the, the, they're, they're fixed, um, but we're, we're, we're on our side and strapped in underneath the, uh, the rover. And there are two other components on Perseverance itself uh, for our Ingenuity mission. So there's a base station, uh, which is a replica actually of the avionics within the helicopter um, and we have an antenna our base station antenna and this base station serves as the 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 system in the middle between the uh the rover and the helicopter so all commands flow from the ground up through the deep space network uh through several satellites down to the rover and the rover passes those commands over to the base station and the base station radiates those through its own uh, antenna and that's how we we're, we will be running operations in a handful of months um, between the two systems. Uh, here's an image of Ingenuity on Perseverance. So, so Perseverance right now is actually uh, upside down. Uh, we're, we're testing some, uh, the, the, the Atlo team here was testing some mass properties uh, of the entire stacked up system. Uh, but you get a great shot of, of Ingenuity within its deployment system on the belly of the rover. And uh, that's, that kind of brings us to the end. So, so uh, going back to where we started, right? Mars helicopter is a technology demonstrator. We're trying to prove that we can, uh, prove that we can fly on Mars and hopefully open up the, the door to the future. Um, whether that's, you know, future rovers paired with scouts, whether or not that's independent helicopters um, or f entire fleets of, of helicopters for the future or multi-copters, uh, that's really what what we're excited about and, and what we're trying to inspire in the future. Um, and I think uh, I think I'll end it there. Well, thanks for that excellent talk, Teddy. Um, the yeah, with the future is quite exciting for Martian exploration. Um, I'm just going to ask one of the questions in the chat to you um, sure. first, and then I think we're run out of time, so we'll go to the panel discussion. Um, so a question that from Martin Azkarati, uh, how big of a problem was it to solve the thermal control of the rotors when spinning at those speeds? Or is the flight not long enough to cause temperature issues? Gotcha. Um, so uh, thermally, before the flights, actually we need to preheat the rotor, the, 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 brushless, the brushless motors that we have um, before the flights to make sure that they're warm enough. During the flights, uh, you hit the nail on the head. The, it's a 90 second flight. So, so we're not too worried about the entire system overheating. Um, the goal is within 30 days, that, that's our mission on Mars, is a 30 day te technology demonstration mission. Uh, we wanna knock out five flights um, spread throughout that month. And each flight's just 90 seconds. So, so uh, not the biggest concern about overheating our actuators within that 90 seconds. Uh, 